All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Fuck Wellness. I'm McKenna. And I'm Mallory. And we are back once again with another episode on the topic of masculinity. This has been by far our most popular theme that we've ever done, which is super exciting. And it means, I think, to us that people are interested and invested in this conversation and that it's one that people are kind of craving to have. So that's an exciting thing. Um, And we're recording together today. Oh, yeah. I forgot. We're recording together um, in Boulder, which is super Laura's fun. Laura's not here. Laura's not here, but she will be here in a couple hours. So that's yeah, exciting. She's not in time for this podcast. not in time for this podcast, <laughs> but that's okay. Um, you get us today. Yeah. So, all right. Um, today we have a great guest and I'm just really excited to learn more about you. Um, so welcome to the pod, Eduardo Talavera. Hi. Hi, everybody. My name is Eduardo Talavera. Pronouns are they, them. And I'm super excited to be here. A little bit about me. I am an accessibility designer in the healthcare space. So I make sure that you know members of the disabled community have access to all the digital experiences uh, in order to you know get access to their their medicine. And uh, it's wonderful to be in the digital design space, but also in the healthcare space because that is something that you know a lot of people need access to. And uh, I also work for a nonprofit called Mask, and so I, we hold space to talk about masculinity, which is why I'm really excited to be here, and we'll get into more of that as well. Uh, some more about me. I love traveling. I love meeting new people, and I love talking. So <laughs> very excited to be here, and thank you both for having me. Eduardo, I don't know if you know this, but you are the reason that we chose masculinity as a topic. Really? Because originally we were going to interview you for a different theme. Yeah. And it just the timing that. didn't work out. Yeah. And then we read your bio and we were like, they would be perfect if we did a masculinity month. And here we are. So oh, I actually think so cool. we have to give you a lot of credit for, <laughs> for this sure. theme existing. But y'all did the work. So I'm glad I was. The yeah. But I mean, you were the inspiration, which I <laughs> yeah. feel like counts for something. <laughs> Definitely. Thank Before you we that. dive into masculinity stuff, could you tell us how you got involved with your work, like what you do now? Because I feel like that's such a, yeah. I've never heard anyone who does that. And I think it's yeah. really interesting and important. It is a really specific, like, like kind of like a niche, um, a niche area within design. So I got my bachelor's degree in graphic design in North Carolina. And that undergrad kind of like planted a lot of seeds for like digital design, but we talked a lot about the, you know, environmental design and like physical spaces and what that means uh, to be like designing wayfinding and airports and things like that. And, and I, you know, I got the opportunity to work with, um, with this company in North Carolina, creating like virtual reality. Uh, they were creating like virtual reality data sets, which sounds like super boring, but basically we like mm-hmm. met this woman who, um, who had low vision and she, wanted to like review, um, she wanted to review the information, like the data points around her child's new school. So they created this, we created this like virtual reality space for her to like adjust herself within this space so that she could like work with the data as she wanted to, right? So that was kind of like my first, um, my first exposure to accessibility. And I was like, wow, this is like really, really huge. Like nobody's, nobody's talked about this before. And, and it's something that like, it's it's like for me I've always felt so um like I guess let me take a step back growing up <laughs> when I was a kid yeah, I would always go back. Yeah. Let's go back. yeah let's go back let's go back I I remember growing up and like interacting with students who were in like the special needs classes and I hate calling them that um and I would I would remember like the way that students interact with them and it was obviously like they weren't treated normal. They weren't treated like normal people. They were like everyone wore gloves around them for some reason. Like they wore masks. They were like in separate classrooms, you know, and I, that always just like didn't I didn't fuck with that. I didn't I didn't and I didn't know why I just like felt this overwhelming amount of like pain and empathy. And I was like, something is wrong here and I don't know what it is. And as I got older and like was exposed to more individuals of the disabled community and then like eventually my own learned about my own disabilities and like my family members disabilities I was like okay this is like a normal thing in my life but how do I make this normal in other people's lives so then I was exposed to that accessibility the world of accessibility in college Um, and then once I graduated I was working as like a like a digital designer just making like flyers and shit for a company 
And I was like, okay, this is great, but I'm not really like making a positive impact, right? Like I'm just making this random little company more money and like love to that company and everyone that works there. But I, I wasn't very fulfilled. And, and I was like, okay, if I, I love my career as a designer and I love what I do, you know, holding space to talk about these things, how can I like to talk about masculinity and disabilities? How can I like, m like uh, bring that into the work that I do on an everyday basis, right? So I kind of started transitioning into this accessibility space and, and now I work at CVS and it's wonderful because I get to work with other members of the disabled community, which is like, we have the saying, we're nothing for us without us. And there's so many companies that work on a lot of like accessibility initiatives and like D DEI, you know, we've seen all of that after 2020 and, and it feels very performative and they, there's not like, like if you have a, a person in charge of DEI or company and they're white, it's like, what the fuck? Like you wouldn't have, it's like when you have a non-disabled person working on disabled products, you're just mm -hmm. like, how do you know what disabled experiences are like if you're not disabled or you don't talk to people who are disabled? So um, yeah, I've just kind of like been slowly transitioning and now I'm in a place where like, that's kind of like my, that's my go-to and it's it's really wonderful. I get to meet amazing people and I, I feel very fulfilled and I'm, you know, doing stuff that, that changes people's lives positively. Could you tell us about some of the challenges in the accessibility design mm -hmm. space right now or some things that you feel like, you know, the listeners of this podcast or just in general people in the U.S. should know, like things that you're working on? Yeah. So I want to say like for starters, it's just having conversations about it. Like I think we tend to tiptoe like non-disabled individuals don't, we're not taught how to talk about like disabilities and people who have disabilities. And so there's this fear of like, well, I don't want to be incorrect, you know, and like, I don't want to speak out of line or say something insulting. Um, and so then we just don't end up talking about it. And so part of that is like, yes, you don't want to be insulting and you don't want to make mistakes. So like Google is free. And so I kind of just like, I encourage everyone to like do their own research on it and then like have the conversations, even though it is uncomfortable, like lean into that and, and understand like, okay, what, whatever experience we're, we're creating, whether it's a physical experience, like a party or, or we're hosting an event or it's a digital accessibility or a digital event, like what forms, what steps can you take to make this experience accessible? Whether it's like providing, I don't even like the word accommodations, but you know how like job interviews say, like, if you need accommodations, let us know. It's like, it shouldn't even be an accommodation. Like, it's just like, I don't even know. I, it I should just, it's just what I need. Like yeah. it shouldn't even be like an accommodation. So, so well, definitely it like, sound like you're inconveniencing. Someone, exactly. Right? Or like yeah. I need extra help and it's like, yeah. it's, I don't need anything extra. And I think it's interesting that we talk about like ableism and disability is like, as if it's a problem of the people who are disabled. And it's like, my disability is not my problem. It's, it's not like this isn't an issue because I'm disabled. It's an issue because I live in a world that wasn't created for mm -hmm. yeah. disabled body, like disabled people who aren't disabled, you know? So the world around us isn't created for people who are disabled. So naturally like there's a bunch of fucking issues that come with that. And so, so yeah, having conversations about like what it means to create inclusive um, experiences. And then like, I think that word of inclusion also gets thrown in the mix and it's kind of like seen like they go hand in hand right like there's there's this like bubble that is inclusion design or just like inclusion in general and then within that is like accessibility design and then like you kind of just like not even design just like accessibility in general and people think when they think about accessibility they think like wheelchair ramps and it's like yeah that's amazing but there's so many other disabilities that aren't like like disabilities that aren't you know you can't look at somebody and say like oh they're disabled mm -hmm. you know and like there's cognitive disabilities there's also permanent t disabilities that we know and there's temporary disabilities like someone who like a mother with a kid in one arm and she's trying to make a reservation for dinner in her other in her other hand with one like one handed on her phone right like mm -hmm. that's a temporary disability she's not able to quickly type on her like keyboard and so if there's a lot of information that's being asked of her it's going to take her twice as long to complete mm -hmm. the task so so yeah, having those tough conversations, um, I think it's also hard because we naturally as people tend to kind of like, we tend to run in packs of or like groups of people that look like us, that act like us, that have the same beliefs, you know? And so like, I don't think there's always that moment of like taking a step back and doing like an inventory of everyone around you. And it's like, wow, I only have like one friend of color. 
or I don't have anyone in my life who's disabled or you know, I don't have anyone in my life that makes less than 55k a year or whatever, you know, and so I think it's like, it's important to surround yourself with people of different backgrounds and, and, um, and different classes. And, you know, I, I hate the word classes, but, but of just different, you know, different backgrounds and, and things like that. Um, you said yeah, that you, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, 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 you're good. I was just like, I focus a lot on like design accessibility, because that's like my thing. But yeah. it, it spans so much more than just like the realm of design. Yeah. I was just going to ask, you said that you had spent some time thinking about the intersection of disability and masculinity. And I'm really mm -hmm. curious to hear your thoughts on where you think that intersection is and like where you think that they are, like there's a lot of overlap and where maybe there's a little bit more challenge between those two. Yeah, I think... Um... I think a lot of the language we just use is really ableist language and we don't realize how how ableist the language that we use is and so you know when you start bringing when you start bringing two two conversations like there are two topics that are held that you have conversations separately right like people talk about accessibility people talk about masculinity but like what is that what does that intersection look like and I think like the language that we use is really important and making sure it's obviously like intentional but I think also like there's just a lack of representation and you know this one's tough hold on I'm gathering my thoughts I'm gathering my thoughts <laughs> I'm just gonna like keep talking because I'll get to something like, yeah, that's a yeah. Huge question. A question. it's a it's a big one but I think you know as more and more people are having like there's a lot of these conversations that are happening in silos, but I think as people are having these conversations more in group settings, I think they're learning more about this intersection. And like, it's it's just hard because it takes so much, it sadly takes a lot of intention to like unlearn the words that we've used, that we've learned to use that are ableist. And also like, it takes intention to say like, hey, we're hosting a party. There's three steps in the entrance, you know, and then there's two steps to get to the back door. So it's not a, it's not like, accessible and like ADA compliance, like for someone in a wheelchair. Like it takes it takes energy and, and intention to talk about those things. And and then like it's seen as still taboo to talk about those kinds of things, you know? And like I remember looking for apartments in New York and asking people like how many steps to your front door? And they're like, well, I don't know. And I'm like, well fucking count. Like <laughs> I'm not gonna be the first or the last person to ask you that, you know? Um and yeah, I think with masculinity, like <sighs> We're really getting into it it's just like the <laughs> lack of of vulnerability across the board and like i think people are just afraid people are afraid to talk about these things people are afraid to talk about masculinity and like people are afraid to be themselves and then they're even more afraid to talk about things like accessibility and and like it's really just a matter of caring for one another and i think we have this like really individualistic mindset because like oh if it doesn't affect me then why should i care you know i don't have anyone who's disabled in my life so why should i care and so i think more and more conversations are happening um, but I think obviously we have like a ways to go. For sure. I had a question and then it is now gone, <laughs> but I, I think that one, I, the whole time you were explaining your work in accessibility, I was just thinking, you know, like you said, with people who don't know how many steps it takes to kind of get to their apartment or whatever it may be, like, those are things that maybe able-bodied people have never had to pay attention mm -hmm. to. And I think even more so, like, I've never really paid attention to how, you know, a user experience is on, you know, a website I go to, uh, unless it's very difficult. Mm -hmm. And I think that's something that's like, now that you are aware of it, or now that I've had this conversation with you, it's like, it's probably going to be one of those things where I see it everywhere. Yeah, it's like, okay, and you now will. it's like, you know, like, this is bad, you know, this is yeah. not good. Um, yeah. And so I think that it's one of those things that, you know, when we shine some light on it, it's important. Um, yeah, and I have this kind of thought I've been thinking about for quite some time, and it's not really fully formed. So I, I apologize if it's a little um, rambly. But, you know, we talk about kind of these things, like you just kind of mentioned something along the lines of, you know, it's just caring about people, right? Like, being courteous and thinking about other people's needs besides your own and how other people might be affected by things, um, how, and how you're not maybe affected by those things and think, 
especially as white people, like that is our responsibility to like figure that out and Mm -hmm. not rely on other people to tell you those things. Um, But I think that there's also, it's such a product of our current culture and our current society of just being at the brim of news and like all these, all these noises and Mm -hmm. social media and all these things of how you should be or what you should be eating or what you should look like or what, like it's, it, the list goes on and on. Right. Yeah. And I think that there can sometimes be, and I'm not saying that this excuses any sort of, mm-hmm. you know, behavior, but I think that it sometimes can be like, I'm on overload. Like I am barely, you know, I'm working three jobs. I can barely, mm-hmm. you know, make all my bills. And <clears throat> now I'm like also really wanting to learn more about all these things, but sometimes it just feels like too much. And mm-hmm. I think that that's a, that's like, um, not an individual problem. I think that's a societal problem. Do you know kind of what I'm saying? Like we are fighting these fights and they're so important to keep fighting and the knowledge is so important to be there. But I think it's also like, and we're fucking overwhelmed. Like this is a lot and people have their own shit they need to work through and we have our own shit. I don't Mm -hmm. know. Do you guys know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. No. Yeah. 100%. We're fighting systemic and societal issues on the ground at 7.24 7.24 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, like on a fucking Zoom <laughs> call. And we're like, let's unpack this. And it's like yeah. wonderful that we're doing this, but like, we're not going to say, we're not going to no. change the world, you know? And like, Mm-mm. like, but I we, think what, yeah, go ahead. I was just going to say like that, that mindset. Yes. But also it's like, but I've no people that this month have listened to even just our podcast, which exactly. is, you know, a pretty small thing. And just been like, you have made me think about, pronouns differently or you have made me think about what being masculine really means or that masculinity does not mean men like all these things and I think that that those conversations I feel like are what are is what our goal is yeah and it makes it all worth it right like I think about this like I think about climate change I hate that I'm going Mm -hmm. here but like climate change right like oh my god Mm -hmm. we're not gonna save the planet like in the next five minutes right talking about this but like I remember when I when I first exposed my best friend in high school to like reusable bags, which at the time was like groundbreaking. It was like 2012, you know? Yeah. It was revolutionary. Like, holy shit, you can reuse these bags. And I remember her being like, I'm not going to do, I'm not going to bring these bags into the store. And I'm like, trust me, it's worth it. Like, you'll feel good about yourself. Like she was hesitant, obviously like, and it's something so dumb as like a bag, but obviously like bigger, like it has but a people bigger will die the on the hill of reusable bags which is just same like with straws to me. like yeah it just yeah. keeps going right but like what I'm getting at is like it it by the end of our trip and like her doing like reusing the bags she was like okay this is actually doable and like six months down the line she's like hey actually now my mom started reusing like plastic bags and now she brings her own bags to the store and she got her sister my aunt also on reusable bag. and it's like something so dumb like a reusable bag but like I just try to focus on like, I, like I said, we're not going to change the world. We're not going to solve these societal issues, but like, what can I do as an individual on a micro, like this little baby microcosm of like this small interaction, like how, and I'm not here to change your mind. I'm just here to expose you to new information. But I also, like you said, recognize that we are consuming more media in a 12 hour period than our ancestors did in their entire fucking lifetime, oh, yeah. Yeah. you know? And like a bitch is tired. We're yeah. overwhelmed. We're <laughs> tired. And like, and the reality is like we live in a world where the burden of changing things for the better has been put on us. Mm-hmm. And like we have to acknowledge that no one's going to fucking save us if it's not us, you know, and like community is is really all that we have at the end of the day. Well, not even that, but there are forces that are actively making mm-hmm. sure that those things don't change. <laughs> that we think it's our responsibility. Yeah. Yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. And we're tired and we're fucking broke and we're yeah. fucking, like, we don't have time to burn this shit down. Well, it's the whole, like, avocado <laughs> toast student loans yeah, exactly. thing. It's like, well, if you ate less avocado toast, then you could pay yeah. off your student loans. And you're like, you think that's the problem? That's you what's that's really holding me back. Yeah. It's like, yeah. no. Yeah. yeah. Coffee it's is pretty missing. expensive now. Yeah, I know. I probably... <laughs> no, for sure. For sure. But that's not the root of the issue. Like, no, 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 no. <laughs> no, I think that concept is so important. The like circle of concern versus circle mm-hmm. of influence. I had, yeah. I had one of the, um, I work at a university and I had our like sustainability coordinator, um, email me and say that a bunch of students were coming to her with concerns about what they call like eco and anxiety, which is essentially like anxiety about climate change and like not knowing how to make an impact okay and and I was really thinking like when she emailed me I was thinking about 
this concept of circle of concern versus circle of influence, which is exactly what you're saying, which is where we spend so much time being worried about things that we can't influence. Mm -hmm. Um, And that just like makes us feel helpless. Mm -hmm. It really like does not help us in the long term. Whereas if we really like get specific about the things that we can influence and this you know is for everything not just climate change like I think about Mm -hmm. this all the time just in my day-to-day life um but I think that concept really helps where it's like what is a small thing that I can do that may have Mm -hmm. like a rolling effect on other people because yeah you're right I'm absolutely not going to end climate change in the next five minutes probably I personally alone will not end it in the next five years no but (laughs) but like you know by offering a vegetarian option at my wedding, for example, maybe yeah. that would save, you know, I don't know, something in the future. Yeah. Because like little decisions that you have control over right. that do make you feel like at least you're playing some role in it. And then I think that component of also being like, but hey, it's actually mostly not my responsibility, which exactly. doesn't mean I'm taking off of the small responsibility that's mine, but it's owning that like, there are larger factors here mm-hmm. than just me. <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah. And like at the end of the day, yeah, we're, I'm not going to change anyone's mind. I'm not going to solve anything, but if I can just expose you to this new way of thinking and like, it's just like a small way of kind of giving yourself like, okay, well I'm trying, like yeah. I'm trying. I, like when the nihilistic thoughts come into yeah. to my head, I'm like, okay, but I'm trying. Right. Like it seems so dumb and it seems so minuscule to have, conversations with my friends about reusable bags or whatever the fuck but like you know it 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 does make an impact and like you'll never really see the impact of those kinds of things you well, know? we always say like it's like planting a seed right exactly like you exactly. get you don't know when that seed might grow in 10 years if someone says that same thing that you said and they can trace it back to like oh my friend mentioned this one time like maybe yeah. i should think about it yeah yeah and i feel like if if we did that more of just like focusing on like what can I do in this moment I think a lot about stand uh what is it passerby or the stand oh bystander effect bystander yeah bystander Mm -hmm. effect thank you I think a lot about that right like oh I don't want to intervene because it's not my business Mm -hmm. or like I don't don't have anything to say like what am I going to do I'm not going to change their mind but it's like babe all you're doing is like just dropping a little little dollop of knowledge and you don't know if they're going to take it or not and that's not on you to decide and it it shouldn't affect you if they do or don't Mm -hmm. but like you have nothing to lose by Mm -hmm. like sharing this little piece of wisdom that worked for you and you just never know what's going to click with somebody you know like I've had conversations about the dumbest things with my friends and then they're like yeah I think a lot about what you said that one day and I'm like don't remember the conversation but I'm glad (laughs) it stuck with you you know like so you just never know what's going to stick and yeah. maybe this episode will stick with people. We don't know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I kind of want to go to, so we've asked every guest so far who's been on masculinity, what they think masculinity means. And I'm mm. super curious to hear your <laughs> thoughts on what your definition of masculinity is. And if that definition has changed at all in yeah. you know, your life, I assume it has. <laughs> <laughs> but so much <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah a lot so you know I'm originally from Puerto Rico and so my family is like diehard Catholics like very mm-hmm. machismo runs it's hella fucking deep uh it's like an everyday battle that my my two other gay siblings all three of us are wow are so it's like <laughs> we joked about when we were growing up and all three of us ended up coming out we would joke that like the Lord is really testing our parents because they were <laughs> I love they were that. so like against it because it's all they knew and I don't hold yeah. that against them you know like it's they is were doing something... the best they yeah sorry sorry is that something that your siblings and you were able to bond over as young people my brother and I yes because we're really close in age we're like 11 and a half months apart I was an accident and <laughs> because <laughs> because my mom didn't know that she was the most fertile after pregnancy but my sister's <laughs> it's my sister's four years older and so, uh, or I'm sorry, my, my sister's four years younger and she like, she never saw herself as being gay. So I think we, she just like fell in love with a woman. So mm-hmm. I think my brother and I were able to bond on that, you know, but like, I don't think my sister and I, I think now it obviously like has brought us together because we go through life as queer individuals, but 
but yeah, it's it's cool to know that like we were all just growing up doing gay shit. Like my brother and I were playing with my sister's Barbies, and my sister was playing with our GI Joes. Like it was oh, really cute. It was just vibe. like everything was the opposite. Like I would be like, oh well, I want a pink dress, and my sister would be like, oh well, I want a blue. Like I want blue overalls. Like you know, just doing like we would just reverse, and they would give something to my sister, and she would just give it to me, and it was like <laughs> that's so we'll funny. just switch, you know. Okay, sorry, so for, I, guess, I just yeah. hijacked Mal's question. Yeah, no, going good, back. But now, now I'm thinking about it. I'm like, that is interesting. We did bond in ways that we didn't even know were like coded, gay coded or queer, yeah. queer coded. Um, but yeah, so like, you know, growing up in a traditional Latino household, I think I was obviously told my whole life that I was supposed to act a certain a, a certain way and like you know, when I got caught using my mom's makeup as a kid, she was like, this is not what little boys do. And I was like, oh, who cares? I want to do it. And so I think for me, masculinity was always like, it was what my parents taught me and what I saw my father and my grandfather and my uncles do, which was like surface level conversations, no tears, no emotions. They were just always playing it cool and also angry like anger anger so much anger and I never understood why everyone was so angry like why all the men in my life were so angry all the time and as I got older and I kind of reevaluated my own like orientation and identity um, I think masculinity shifted from this like performance of things that I was supposed to be saying and doing to like ways that I was supposed to be expressing myself and so then it like it didn't even shift from this to that it just like compounded so then it was like the things that I was supposed to be saying the things that I how I was supposed to react to things how I was supposed to dress right it was just all of this like performative like here's a ticket of all the things that you should be doing right and I would just look at that and be like I don't want any of that and it took me a really long time to realize that like for me masculinity isn't what I wear or how much facial hair I have it's really just like it's really about just how I feel and how I treat other people, if that makes sense. Like, because it, I obviously have like testosterone coursing through my body. Right. But like, so do y'all, we just have different amounts of it. Right. Yep. And like, I don't think that biologically on like a scientific level, and I don't know enough about this, but like, I, d I don't think that there's an actual difference in the way you and I respond to things aside from like how we're socially conditioned. If we were socially conditioned to be the same, there would be no like, oh, well, this person has more testosterone, so they're going to naturally be more angry when they mm -hmm. say they ran out of chips at, an, at, a, at a restaurant, you know? Like, mm -hmm. So I think it just shifted from, like, presentation and, and how I'm supposed to act and all of these should, should be doing and should be saying and should be feeling to just, like, well, how do I feel internally? And, like, how, how do I... <sighs> this is tough. This is tough because, for me, it's been rooted in so much love because I've realized how masculinity has been a vessel for hate and violence for so long especially in like my culture and my family that like for me now my masculinity is rooted in just like pure like radical love that I give myself and others like free fucking tickets at uh at a carnival you know because it's just like I have been hurt by so many men and like everyone around me has been hurt by so many men in the name of like not even in the name but through toxic masculinity and it's just been a vessel for so much hate and and violence and I think like there's been so much there's been so much of like I don't even want to say forgiveness but like we've taken the blame off of men and just said like oh well it's just testosterone coursing through their veins you know like they're just angry men like they're just boys boys will be with like boys will be boys they'll just do the like men are just supposed to be angry supposed to be repressed and it's like we're completely take like there's no accountability there's no accountability there and so I really struggle with that um and yeah I, I I'm just rambling at this point because I'm thinking so much about like what masculinity means to me and I think it's just it's a it's a really fluid thing for me at this point in my life because I can like, I, I think there's also privilege, right? Like I feel so much privilege in the fact that like I could go outside right now, take this wig off, grow my beard and like, Oh, Hey man, like I would be treated like a dude, like a person, like a man. And like, I would most likely get the things that I want because I'm also a white, like a white person, you know? So it's just like, there's a lot of privilege in, in my masculinity and I, um, I acknowledge that and I, I try to I don't try to hide it but I just try to kind of like use it for good I guess <laughs>
It's interesting to think about the example of like, oh, a man is supposed to be angry because of testosterone when it's like on the flip side, the example is always used of like a woman can't be in office because they're too emotional. Like it, yeah. it, to me, it's like the same argument. So it's like, all right, like let's like, we can't double dip here. Like to your point, <laughs> we like, double dip we're here. all like this, the same. And yeah. this kind of brings me to something that recently a man in my life said to me and he was kind of having a hard day and this person has been kind of like I don't want to really go too into it but like has not had like the easiest few months I guess and I can just feel a lot of anger within them and they mentioned to me like again yeah this is a man and he said um something along the lines of being upset that day and then saying I must be on my period or something along those lines and I was like And in the moment, like, I'm so disappointed that I was so shocked that I didn't say anything. Like I didn't correct him. And later thinking about it, I'm like, that is so inappropriate. Like one to say to me. Absolutely. And and two, just to say in general, like who, Yeah. why would we say that? Like, oh, because you're a man, you don't get to have feelings. Like you don't get to be upset. Like you have to have, you have to be breathing for you to feel like you, you have permission to be angry or whatever like I don't know that's also like a whole other conversation about how we've like made women like bleed like a demonized it and all that absolutely that's an entirely different thing but I don't know that also just, we all also, have hormone cycles yeah like, exactly just, like, we all have say. hormone cycles like we're all allowed to be angry you don't have to bleed to yeah. be ang- like you don't have to bleed to justify your anger yeah. and I think it's fascinating because like if he said that around you a woman what the fuck is he saying around his dudes like right? his friends that's what scares me like that's what that when I have conversations where like men say things like that to me and I'm just like hey that's not okay like Mm -hmm. what are you saying with your other male friends you Mm -hmm. know like someone who's not like I'm a queer person and it's very obvious right like because of my mannerisms whatever but like what are you saying to your hyper masculine like straight friends like Mm -hmm. cis friends you know it's scary <laughs> yeah and also and it's even scarier because it's like this is someone who I know it wasn't done in a malicious way it was done in an ignorant way yeah and to me that's almost even worse because I'm Absolutely. like okay this is embedded Ingrained. in yeah in your and yeah. who you are and he's a little bit older and I'm just like this is I don't know it's just there's so much to, to unpack yeah. there's so much to unpack in a situation like that because like what are you gonna say to him in that moment that's going to make him realize that that's not okay aside from like hey let's not make these jokes but like clearly other people have made the jokes in his life this is not the first time he's made that joke in his life like right. he is not he is not new to the world of of yeah. misogyny and like it's yeah. it's hard because yeah what do you say in that moment but also like I should say something but also you were processing what you were saying so mm-hmm. like you didn't do anything wrong but it's so heavy mm-hmm. to have to feel that and to live with that and that it's not going to be the last time yeah it sucks. definitely not Okay, I'm going to throw another big question at you. (laughs) I'm sorry. No, 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 it's okay. Um, That's why we're here. (laughs) I'm curious to hear more about, like, your relationship with your own queerness and how that has impacted your masculinity or, like, how that has challenged or, like, become aligned with your masculinity, any of those options. (gasps) Oh, yeah. I think it's funny because when I look back at pictures – like there's such a clear distinction from like freshman year of college when I was living in a dorm and I was like running around with all these like frats and like sorority people like you can see in my pictures where I like kind of dropped the whole masculine act and I was like I don't need to shave like I don't need to have a beard in this in this way I don't need to dress a certain type of way like and then I started kind of Like, once I started leaning into myself, I started running. I keep saying, like, running with the the pack of wolves. I don't know why. But, like, I started hanging out with other queer people. And so, like, sophomore year of college, I was already being put in situations where, like, this is my friend, like, Izzy. And they use they, them pronouns. And I'm like, oh, fuck, this is going to be hard. But I was, like, 18, 19 years old. You know, like, most people don't have those experiences where they're put in a situation like that so quickly and so early into college. And obviously not everyone goes to college. So I think... um, I think like my queerness showed me very quickly that there's like other ways of living and other ways of expressing myself. And then once I started surrounding myself with 
the little like to me they were always little oddballs because they like stood out and I would look at them and be like I am that I want to be that I want to I want to stand out I want to be myself and I think that's why they I, they're oddballs and they stand out to me is because they are breaking the status quo and they are you know being non-conventional because being yourself doesn't feel like it's supposed to be conventional and that's actually uh, so profound <laughs> <laughs> and wow like, that really cut deep <laughs> yeah, I know. now I'm like kind of fucked up by that because I'm like why not no um yeah I think there's so much healing that has taken place by leaning into my queerness and like by being surrounded by other queer people and it's like I think it's hard because we still live in a society where when I say the word queer people automatically think like oh they're just hanging out with a bunch of gays and that's not always the case like you can you can be queer and still date someone of the opposite sex right like and I struggle so much with labels because to me like everything is a fucking blur Mm -hmm. and we need labels because we need to make sense of things, but I still dream of a place where I don't have to justify my identity or like, I don't have to put a label to anything. I just am. And we just do, and we just are, and we just be, you know, like we should be titties out eating fruit floating down a river. But anyways, uh, <laughs> we have J-O-Bs. So <laughs> I think, yeah, I think like being surrounded by so much queer, like radical self-acceptance, there was a lot of healing that took place. I could see the healing that was being done around me. And like, I could feel how much healing needed to take place inside of myself. And I think I've like, that's why when I look back at my relationships growing up, like I was always better friends with the girls in my class. And I wanted to go to the girl sleepovers, right? Because like, I could see the way that they were interacting. And I would be like, this is whole, like, this is authentic. They're like, they're playing with dolls or doing whatever they want to do. The boys are just like running around throwing dirt at each other, you know, like they were, yeah. and even from like fifth grade, like, and on, like, I could just see the delineation of how we're socialized in so many different ways. And um, what was the question? <laughs> <laughs> well, wait, I want to go back to your freshman year because okay. I think that seems to be like a pretty pivotal point for when mm-hmm. you like processed through deciding to be more authentically yourself. But I'm sure that didn't happen overnight or maybe there was an experience that kind of led that, you know, led you to that change. But I'm curious, like, that's first of all, like a really brave decision to like be who you are like I know that sounds silly to say yeah. but you know when you're in <laughs> oh, that no, yeah. community like it can be hard to mm-hmm. you know want to I don't know be authentic so I'm curious also, what that like, looks like being 18 like yeah 18 yeah. is a baby like that is such an yeah. age where it's like you are just floating and <laughs> like yeah. I mean, well, most uh, people not everyone you know yeah, like I yeah, think yeah, that yeah, there's, yeah. you're kind of just like I'm and I'm on this rock and we're gonna I guess mm-hmm. do the next thing that's in front of me. Kind yeah. Of. So I'm but just, yeah, I'm so curious serious. about your thoughts. Yeah. You, and like how yeah. that felt for you. <clears throat> I Not to bring like, you back to trauma. <laughs> no, think, no, but. it's okay. But it's, it is all trauma at the end of yeah. the day. And that's what exactly what I was going to get at. Like yeah. <laughs> I had to mature at a very early age because of trauma. And like, because yeah. I wasn't getting what I needed as a queer neurodivergent, whatever, like the, I don't, I'm not going to sit here and label everything, but like, you know, as as someone who who needed some extra love in different ways than what my family could give me, and again, nothing against them, they gave me the they did the best they could with what they had. Um, I realized at a very young age that, like, okay, I have to care for myself in in different ways than other kids have to care for themselves, and I think also like, and this is something that's very, um, it's very intense to talk about, but like, there's a lot of Okay. As a gay person in the world, we don't have the same like young relationships and like young love and normal hookups. Like we don't go to school and be like, oh, I have a cute crush. Cause like there's like there's crushes, but they're mostly straight. And if they're gay, then it's it's just like it's a weird, it's a weird thing when you're gay and you're seeing all your friends around you talk about love and like you're feeling all of these things because you're going through puberty. And so what I'm getting at is there's a lot of hookups that happen at a really young age for gay men. Like guy, like kids are on the apps at like 15, 16, 17 years old and they're hooking up with much older men because like they don't have any, or at least when I was growing up, like we didn't have anywhere to turn to look at what healthy gay relationships look mm-hmm. like, right? Like there were no shows, there were no movies that talked about this in a healthy way. And, and so I was one of them, unfortunately. Like I was someone who was really, really, really young and like barely the age 
of like legal sex in North Carolina going around meeting people under the guise that I was 18. And like, for me, that was something that like felt so normal. And I look back now and I'm like, that's not fucking normal. And it's, it's scary that so many of my friends, like gay friends have also had to go through that at such a young age. And like, I think there's also so much to unpack as like being a fat person as well. Like I didn't get any attention from the other gays in my area that were my age because I was fat. And like, the, that's a whole other thing, like fat phobia in the gay community. Yeah. But um, what I'm getting at is that like, I had to, I had to mature emotionally at a really young age because I was hanging out with people that were way older than me. And so by the time I got to college, I was like, okay, something's obviously not like, I don't just fit in with my roommate, Harry, who, if you're watching this, love you. <laughs> like, he's just a <laughs> cis, like white man from Maryland. Um, but like, and we got along and we, we had a great time, but I could always feel that like, I don't have the same, I'm not walking the same path as him. Mm -hmm. And so I think also like I moved out of a dorm after freshman mm -hmm. year and, um, and I did a lot of like introspection freshman year because I kept hanging out with so many people in sororities and fraternities. And I was like, this is not hitting. Like I'm hanging out with all these people, always going to dining halls, going to parties, doing all these things, but I don't fucking know anything about these people. And everything felt so superficial. Mm -hmm. And I was craving like, at the end of the day, I was just craving community and like human interaction and like emotional intimacy. And I wasn't getting, I was getting human interaction and like parties and like, you know, doing things, but I wasn't getting, I wasn't sitting down and actually having conversations about what it means to be yourself, whether that's queer, straight, cis, whatever the fuck, like they're just, those conversations weren't happening. And so that's when I was like, okay, I have to find people that look like me, that act like me, that have the same, like, the same identities, the same ideas, like, it's similar in some way, shape, and form that isn't, like, I am able-bodied and I can drink. <laughs> you know? How did like, you find those people? So I had a friend, um, her name was Hema, and we were in graphic design together, and she invited me to, like, this little, this little cookout one day. Um, our dining hall was like having like a little, yeah, like a, a little cookout. And she invited me and I sat on the grass and it was like the three, literally the only three non-white people in the entire yard of people. And she was like, come hang out with us. And I was like, okay, cool. And obviously this was not my first experience hanging out with people of color, but it was like one of my first experiences hanging out with queer people my age that like actually were looking for friends. And I was like, wow wow they like asked my name asked my pronouns they asked like what I studied and like what I like to do in my free time like it felt like a friend date like everyone was taking turns talking about themselves in really intimate beautiful ways and I was like oh, this is what it's like to be vulnerable <laughs> and I was addicted I was immediately like more of this more of this please like I need this emotional intimacy and this vulnerability and and I realized like okay start doing that with yourself and then you'll just find more of it Right. So like the more time I spent with myself and and kind of like dissecting my own personality and the things that that work for me and don't work for me and like how to set boundaries and like what does it mean to be queer and fat and blah, 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 blah. Like the more I spent time figuring myself out, the more I was able to like walk through life and say like, yes, this situation works for me no, this situation doesn't work for me. This group of people like fulfills me in X, Y, and Z ways. And this group of people fulfills me in A, B, and C ways, you know? And so, and it's still a, an ongoing journey of like figuring myself out, right? And I think like, I think one of the most important things for me was like relinquishing that, like what was the the block of wood that they forced like thieves or witches and whatever the fucking like the olden days to put your like arms in oh, your head yeah. through that's what it feels like to be socialized with the guise of like masculinity no. <laughs> the guillotine. it wasn't a guillotine no no nobody's head is getting chopped off no you're just like sitting there with your it's arms not the gallows is it no, because no, that was where they hung people. Yeah. Oh. There was no death involved. <laughs> We're there's like no doing death involved. In this, I know there's no death involved in the situation <laughs> or the scenario. It was just like a instead of like books. <laughs> yeah, instead of arresting them by putting them in handcuffs, like they yeah. they put them their arms and their head yeah. through like a block. I feel like of there are people that's... listening to this podcast who are yelling <laughs> out the name for it. Yeah, <laughs> really forgive sorry. us, forgive us. Sorry, <laughs> sorry. It's not. We're not killing anyone. There's again no, no, no death no in this death. situation. No. <laughs> um, but I feel like that's what it felt like to grow up with this pressure of like, you have to be like masculinity, all the stereotypical traits that we all know to be 
like not true or I guess true but not necessary <laughs> and so when I realized that I could just like oh I could just like slip out of that like <laughs> you know like my hands like slipped right out and like my head like slipped right out I was like wow when I relinquished all of the should I should mm -hmm. be feeling this I should be doing that and like mm -mm, how am I feeling like how do I want to be feeling what do I want to say how do I want to present myself like everything just kind of started like falling into place because I was listening to myself right and I surrounded by people I was surrounded by people not even surrounded by people I made the choice because it, it, an, it is an active choice like I went out of my way to find these people and like to continue being in community with these people so I surrounded myself with people that were also leaning into themselves and relinquishing this like should I should be more feminine or I should be more masculine and like that was that was very like revolutionary for me what beautiful, I think one discernment that you had of like, you know, if this is what feels good and this is what doesn't feel good. And having that at such a young age, I think is such a gift. Cause I think everyone has probably felt that on some level, right. Of like, yeah. this feels like an icky relationship, or this feels like I'm not really able to truly be myself, but yeah. it's not always, I think it, it takes a lot of bravery and courage to act on something like that. And I think through kind of what you were just sharing, I think like even me, like for, to give an example in my life, like I find myself, I think I'm very in tune with my body and all of that. Mm -hmm. And just this summer, I had like a big realization about my sexuality that like rocked my entire world, flipped it upside down. And I was like, yeah. actually, what the fuck? <laughs> like, Literally. Hello? Like this was mm -hmm, here the mm -hmm. whole time. And it was so like deep, <laughs> deeply like hidden in shame. And yeah. um, I had like a very crazy moment where I just like randomly burst out sobbing and like came to this kind of like conclusion uh, inside my body, which is like a, an amazing thing. And I feel so much more yeah. like myself now, but it's yeah. like, I'm just thinking of like you getting to have that experience or similar experiences. And obviously they continue as we grow up. Right. But like yeah. thinking about, <laughs> that at 18 seems really just like go you truly like that is amazing <laughs> thank you I think it was really heavy like I was going through some heavy shit and I was but I was like determined like I was watching everyone around me grow in different ways and like okay I to me like everyone is trans right? Because we're all transitioning. And some of us just take it a little further than others, right? Like mm -hmm. you all transitioned from little girls to women, right? Like mm -hmm. I transitioned from a little boy to a beautiful they, them, right? Like, <laughs> so yeah. like we're all trans, it, we're all in these constant states of transition. And I would just like see people around me changing in like, but in the ways that were expected of them. Mm -hmm. And there was, there was like something. Like following a script versus like right, and transitioning everything... into who they are exactly there felt there was no authenticity and I was like okay they look the same they look the same they're acting the same now I'm getting people's names confused because they look the same they act the same they talk the same everyone's saying the same shit like what's going on and I think like I had a really I had a moment when I was a kid and I was watching my mom's friend interact with her kids she like the kid the the baby was crying or something and I don't I was like really young and I don't even remember how old I was but I just remember the mom kneeling down and like looking at the little boy and being like, how are you feeling right now? And the little boy was like uh, 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 trying to like talk about how he was feeling. And she just like so fucking patiently was like, yeah. Okay. So how are you feeling? And she like kind of kept, she, st she sat there and she waited for him to be like, I'm sad. And she was like, okay. And, and like, what's going on? Why are you sad? And I was like, that's oh I need to talk to myself okay cool and I don't know why I made that connection at such a young age that like okay cool I need to do that for myself mm. like I need to just ask myself how I'm feeling because no one's fucking asking me how yeah. I'm feeling so I just have to ask myself and it's really wild that she will never I don't even know her name she'll never know how much she impacted my life in that moment <laughs> but look I at that seed that was being now. planted she didn't exactly. even know it exactly you didn't even know it like, the little dollop yeah <laughs> I have to grab my computer charger really very fast, but you guys can keep going. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I really don't want this to die. It won't die. Okay. Okay. Um. Okay. <clears throat> you said earlier, and I think this was like such a beautiful like phrasing that your masculinity today manifests a lot of times as just loving others, like mm -hmm. just putting love out to the world. And so I was just wondering like that, 
and like, what does your masculinity look like today? And how do you get in touch yeah. with it when you're feeling disconnected? I'm going to mute just so that um, when yeah. we plug in and there's not noise. <laughs> yeah, you can keep talking. I'm just going to mute. Okay, us. yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I'm thinking. I think for me, like recharging isn't even about like, like I think partially it's about spending time with myself right and like doing things that make me feel right and I'm or make me feel good and I'm ta talking about like self-care routines or like like a skincare routine I'm I'm talking genuinely like oh I'm going to like well my power the power just flickered I'm talking about things that like it's it all sounds the same but I like just doing whatever the fuck I want to do. Literally just like asking myself, like, what do you want to do today? And not not policing my thoughts, not policing what I'm eating, how much money I'm spending. Like, just do. I'm obviously not going to the fucking Apple store and buying a new Apple product or whatever, but like just honoring whatever I'm feeling in that moment. And that's what it looks like for me to heal and charge, recharge is just like, what do you need, right? Like giving myself whatever I need, whether it's laying in bed all day, like not looking at my phone or laying in bed, looking at my phone, like just guilt-free, like that's what it means to me to, to to just fucking heal like just let go of all the things that I should be doing and like guilting myself and just like stop policing it and I think in regards to masculinity for me it's not even about like surrounding myself with other with like masculine energy or like men right it's really I get more energy out of being around non-masculine energy for some reason like for me it's it's like a give and a take like when I'm in a situation with like I'm where I'm staying now I'm with these like three other girls where obviously like there's there's not a ton of masculine energy in the house I would say or like one would say um and I don't bring a ton of it obviously but I bring some kind of like perspective and some kind of energy that like um that like not even counteracts but it just kind of like balances it out I don't know somehow this one's tough because like I feel like there's so much there's so much we think about when we say like masculine energy like what even is masculine energy right like if I sit here and I say masculine energy I immediately think like oh someone with a deep voice and like yeah. but these are all just characteristics of people right and like there's feminine people like there's really 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 beautiful women that have deep voices right just like there's really beautiful men who have high-pitched voices and so it's really hard because we've been conditioned to think about masculine and femininity as like either body parts or like f just like physical things right and like it's hard to put into words what masculine energy is and like people talk about like the divine feminine and what that looks like and like embodying femininity and, it, and to me like embodying femininity is just like I don't know why it feels so radical, but like, it's, it's literally just doing, to me, it's doing the opposite of what you're told to do. Because like, my whole life I was told to do a certain, to act a certain way and to do a certain thing. And then I just started doing the opposite and leaned into myself. And so that, that was obviously not the divine feminine. I'm not saying that that's the divine feminine. I'm just, what I'm getting at is like, I, I feel like I get so much energy from people that are just like doing things a little bit differently, you know? And like, to me, differently means leaning into their truth leaning into themselves and like not being apologetic of who they are and like not not bending their boundaries for like well I should respond to this person because like they they do that for me and it's like friendships are non-transactional babe like just because they drive you around doesn't mean you have to drive them around right like so I I kind of heal and learn and and charge myself in a lot of ways from people that just kind of tend to honor themselves uh mm -hmm. yeah that's that was beautiful. a lot. I don't know if I got anywhere, but <laughs> no, I love that. I think kind of to close, unless Miley, you have something different. I'd love to hear, you know, if someone's listening and maybe they're struggling with their masculinity or masculinity in general, or with other people, I guess kind of like, what would you give to people as kind of like a takeaway about like masculinity in general, how we engage with it, how we should be engaging with it? Ooh. We've thrown so many big questions. Yeah, honestly, here. you're I a know. Here. This is no, great. this is good. I I like this is funny because I tried my best to mentally prepare for this conversation. Obviously, you can't. Like, I was like frantically trying to read 
scripture, not like by biblical oh. scripture, I don't know what I said, but like <laughs> reading academic, like scholarly articles. Bringing back that, like, Catholicism. It, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I was like, I don't need to read anything about what it means to be masculine. Like I just need to be myself. Yeah. But anyways, yeah. um, I think like, I think for me, there's just like a lot of, there's a lot of accountability and healing that needs to take place. And like the biggest thing for me is holding space for accountability in in ways that aren't like, oh, my friend called me out, right? Like I was with the boys and I said some fuck shit and they like, they really like, they all started yelling at me and it was like a whole thing. Like I believe in the power of like accountability in the sense of like calling someone in and I've shifted my perspective from like, someone calling me in or even calling me out as like an attack and more as like a a place like coming from a place of love right and so like I encourage people especially people who are very much in tune with their masculinity and like specifically men (laughs) there's there's a lot of healing that has to take place and when someone does bring you in for some form of accountability like it's not coming from a place of hate unless you've caused some harm like it's usually coming from a place of love right and like I think there's just a lot of like I don't know, open heart, open mind. That's literally it. Like just walk through life with an open heart, open mind. Like just because you don't like sports doesn't mean like everyone else hates sports. I don't know. It's not that simple. I know. It's it's hard because I feel like I <laughs> I've done so much work on myself and I'm surrounded by so many people that are doing work that it's it is so normalized, but I acknowledge that like the reality is there's so many people struggling with their relationship with masculinity and like now more than ever with social media, like we're we're even further socializing men and masculine folk to act a certain way. And, and I just encourage people to question it. Like wh- when a man feels or someone who is masculine identifying feels that like, Oh, well, I should be doing this. Like, why, 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 why? Anytime you think like I need to be doing this or I should be doing that. Like just pause and ask yourself, like, is this actually going to benefit me? Do I want to be acting this way? Who says I need to be acting this way? Mm-hmm. Like why, why, why just everything? Why? And I think that's also why I've gotten so comfortable with myself is because I've just been able to stop and ask why for everything. So yeah, open heart, open mind. (laughs) I love that. And it's so funny because like we start all these conversations out during our masculinity month and we're like, and this is wrong and this is wrong and this is wrong, which is like true. But we always end at the end of like the podcast episode, we always end of like, and we're all human beings. And Mm -hmm. the solution feels simple. And the solution is to like, learn how to listen to yourself and to learn how to accept who you are as a human um, on this earth right now and experiencing everything we experience and, you know, having compassion for the systems that make it difficult to be authentic in that experience, you know? And I think, I don't know, it's just, you summed it up so beautifully. Yeah. So I love it. Oh, do you have anything else now? I don't think so. Well, First of all, just thank you so much for coming on and trusting us with yeah. this conversation. I think that it's very important that we are continuing to have these conversations on this podcast, obviously. But I mean, I know it's spurred conversations in our just personal lives with people that mm-hmm. we know. And so we hope that that continues to happen kind of for everyone. Um, and yeah. then where can people find you if they want to connect with you, you know, follow you on Instagram, those fun things? Yeah. So I'm on Instagram as fritos.mp3. I I come up as user not found because I just yes. love I love to throw people for a curveball and it's funny because when I give that up people are like oh it says user not found and I'm like exactly oh yeah I fully <laughs> is this a d- design joke yeah no it's not even a design joke I just like <laughs> I don't know I love leaning into the mystery of like wait it says like my Spotify's yeah. user not found and I I don't know like it just it's cool when That's... people say like no oh, it makes you like think found. twice it makes you yeah, yeah. pause. Uh, Cause it's like, am I really here? Is this even real? Anyways, so I'm on, yeah, I'm on Instagram. We're in a simulation. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, uh, and <laughs> um, and then the work that I do, <laughs> the work that I do for mask is uh, mask dot online. And so again, that's just like a nonprofit that holds space to talk about uh, masculinity and our relationships with it. Perfect. Um. Well, everyone, check those things out. Especially, I feel like I want to do some more research on mask. That seems super cool. Um, yeah. yeah. And if you see user not found, it is you. <laughs> <laughs> it's <Yeah>. me. <laughs> um, all righty. Well, thank you, Eduardo, so much. We hope that you enjoy your latest adventure. Um, and yeah, I don't know. Let us know anytime you're doing anything cool. We'd love to 
promote it or have you on. This is awesome. Yeah, definitely. No, thank you again. Thank you for holding space for us to talk about this. And also just thank you for all that you do. I love seeing your content and I think you guys are doing really great work. So thank oh, you. Thank you. Doing our best. Yeah. And thanks everyone <laughs> yes. for listening. <laughs> yeah. Thanks everyone. Okay. <laughs> Me acknowledging them. Yeah. I love it. Big love. <laughs>